Are you looking for a God conscious husband? Or do you have a friend that is looking for a compatible spouse? Getting married is one of the most important decisions of your life. So before you embark on your marriage journey, you need answers so you have clarity and confidence to find a compatible husband. Smart Single Muslimer is a thought provoking Muslim marriage guide for Muslim women. In the book, you'll discover how to find a husband, how to find out if you are compatible, what questions to ask a potential spouse, and how to deal with disappointment. Adopting a smart Islamic approach to relationships is about following some simple prophetic principles that will change your habits and attitudes about getting married. If you want honest pre-marriage advice that addresses contemporary issues you're facing, then you will find this book extremely useful. Available to buy on Amazon in Kindle or paperback format. Asalaamu Alaikum and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Farhat Amin. If you're new here, then the podcast, Smart Muslimer, we discuss issues, contemporary issues mainly relating to ex- the experiences of Muslim women really. And so inshallah, if you would like to subscribe to our newsletter, you can do that via the website, smartmuslimer.com. Uh, And inshallah, I hope you enjoy today's podcast. So today my guest is Zara Chowdhury. She is the editor of Sacred Footsteps. And I recently came across a really interesting article that she wrote for the website. And the article is titled Unveiling the Algerian and the full title is French Colonial Photography. So Aslam alaikum Zara, welcome to the podcast. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for having me. Alhamdulillah, uh, pleasure is all mine. Um, so before we begin speaking about the article, could, for you know, for some of my listeners, they may not have heard of Sacred Footsteps before. So what made you begin, um, you know, and start this website? Um, so initially it was just the fact that there were not that many good resources online focused on Muslim travellers, um, because we started this about six or seven years ago now so at that time especially um, I was traveling a lot and I kind of experienced that firsthand. Um, Additionally there was very little reliable up-to-date information about spiritual or religious sites such as Maqams Um, and so if you wanted to visit places like that you really had to know someone who'd already been who could tell you where to go and you know etc. And I guess more than that I felt that there needed to be more focus on highlighting different aspects of Muslim culture and history. Um, So for instance, I visited Vietnam and Mm. there's a Muslim community there um, who surprisingly have quite a long history. But at that time, there was nowhere you can go online and kind of do any kind of research or find out anything about them. Um, And so Sacred Footsteps kind of really came from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I I didn't know we had, you know, a community of Muslims in Vietnam. It does, you're right, it makes me think when I went to, when we wanted to visit the Alhambra in Spain, when I then went online, it was mainly non-Muslim documentaries and historians who we were then watching and reading, and that's who we were getting our information from. So you're, you're definitely right about historical you know um websites you can go that would you know show you what the muslim perspective is and um yeah exactly and and so because so for example i know it's just side point there was something i saw on your website by Ertugol. so we've got an article about how to visit his tomb um and also other people other um i was going to say characters but of course they're based (laughs) on real people (laughs) Um, yeah, so we have an article about how to how to visit his um, resting place, written by somebody called Hamza Sheikh, who mm-hmm. visited all those sites himself. Um, but yeah, I think that a lot of the time, many of the kind of most famous, you know, Islamic sites, the literature written on them is often by um, either by non-Muslims or is kind of secular sources, right? But that's changed a lot, I would say, in the last like five years. There are more publications more platforms kind of dedicated to this kind of thing but for us the focus is really on the stories that are often overlooked Mm -hmm. so for example within West Africa there's a real um, a real tradition of scholarship that goes back a thousand years Um, and so we work with Mustafa Briggs who's one of our writers and he his focus is on you know highlighting that tradition specifically Um, and then we have others who kind of focus on other areas but yeah, for us, it's really about highlighting those things that we as Muslims also overlook. 
for whatever reason because we kind of tend to concentrate on the cultures that we're from ourselves mm. um and so we also have a podcast as well so that's one of the things we oh excellent on. what's the, what's the name of the podcast N- not the most imaginative name <laughs> sacred footsteps the podcast okay <laughs> Yeah, so if you Google that, it should come up. Okay, alhamdulillah, because it is, I would, uh, I'd, I, I spent a little bit of time on the website and I thought I'm have to come back and look at this properly because there is a lot of stuff um, that you don't normally see. Like there's, some, there's a nice article about Jamaica, it's, uh, Muslims in Jamaica, and it really is, it's, it's very multicultural. It's and multicultural. And also, you know, the images um, on the site and on, on your Instagram page, they're very positive images of Muslims just in a, their normal environment. It's, and that's what was really nice as well, just seeing all the different types and the way of Muslims we are and, you know, globally. But it was all very positive. That's the thing that I really liked yeah. about it. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, actually, because it we really focus on um, challenging a lot of the kind of dominant stereotypes. So a lot of our work focuses on challenging Orientalism in particular, because the way Muslims are portrayed even today has its roots in Orientalism itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, for us, that's a very deliberate decision. Like the, the images we use, everything like that, um, we put a lot of thought into those kind mm-hmm. of things. Well, th- that would actually be the next thing I'd like to ask you that, you know, if if any of our, um, our listeners, if they don't know what Orient- Orientalism is, could you please explain that? OK, so Orientalism was a term coined by Edward Said. Um, initially, the term was used purely um, so academics would refer to themselves as Orientalists. It was just people who whose um, academic output kind of focused on the Muslim world or Eastern cultures, um, because there was this kind of, I suppose, is binary thinking that um, the world is East and West. And so people who focused on Eastern cultures and history in their work refer to themselves as Orientalists. Um, and then Edward Said wrote this book, Orientalism, in the 70s. Mm. Um, and the book is really about kind of, you know, exposing the kind of representations of Eastern people as inferior, which has kind of run through academia and literature for centuries. Um, and he kind of goes into the history of that and the fact that um, Eastern people were being represented as exotic um, and as the great other in inverted commas and used as kind of a their definition was always put in juxtaposition with the, with the definition of who the West is and who Europe in particular is. And so where Europe is superior and enlightened, mm-hmm. um, the East is backward and uneducated and uncivilized and in need of civilizing. And those kind of that kind of thinking fed into colonialism, too, because it helped justify the colonial project. Mm-hmm. I know I read that book maybe 20 years ago and I think I need to read it again um, the one thing I do remember from that and it's interesting he wasn't Muslim he was Christian well so he his focus was mainly on literature kind of fantasy element a lot of that came from orientalist paintings uh-huh. um, so yeah so what we're going to talk about um, later on will kind of tie in with that too but um, a lot of the paintings kind of focused on the the harem what they imagined the harem would look like let's mm-hmm. say um, and it was this kind of this fantasy of women who are sexually available, who are completely passive and who are there purely for the pleasure of the spectator who was always a male. Mm-hmm. So th- so actually that, yeah, that does bring us now on to the, the article that you wrote. What made you want to, wh- why were you interested in, in writing um, about the unveiling of, um, you know, the women of Algeria? And French colonial photography. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, we focus a lot on cha- challenging Orientalism. So one of the areas we've really worked on is photography. Um, and so I've written about colonial representations of African and Asian people before and how um, those images were used to justify colonialism and also racism too. And so this was kind of a natural progression from that because in many ways, the images that were taken in Algeria um, and other parts of North Africa too, it wasn't just Algeria, but they're really a very extreme example of how those representations were very deliberately constructed. And so if people go onto the website, they could find the article there and see some of these images, but they were all staged because like I said, photographers would use these representations really, they were kind of an extension of the regime in the sense that they were hired by the colonial regimes Mm -hmm. and to create these images that were then distributed within Europe and aimed at kind of 
they would either reinforce existing stereotypes or they were used for propaganda purposes in, t in terms of justifying the colonial project. Mm -hmm. And so when photographers went to Algeria, it was difficult for them to take pictures of women because they were obviously covered from head to toe um, and they didn't have access to private spaces either. So they had no access to Algerian homes. And so to get past that, what they did is that they hired women from the margins of society. Um, and so they were either in, living in poverty or they were prostitutes, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. They hired them, they, they put, put them in studios, they dressed them up however they wanted to. And they took these images, which you could refer to as harem photos because that's kind of what they were portraying. The paintings that I mentioned earlier, these images were almost an exact recreation of those paintings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you show that on the website. Um, so you, you mentioned that they wanted to reinforce stereotypes that existed. What were those stereotypes of um, Muslim women at that time? Um, so at that time, the only visual reference they had for Muslim women were these paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, the paintings came from the literature and the, the photos came from the paintings kind of in turn. And so, yeah, for, so at that time, that's, that's really the only representation they had was of these um, often topless women lying in, you know, in reclining positions on top of cushions, etc. So, yeah, so these photos really were the, the first kind of visual, the first photographic representation, let's say, of Muslim women. And mm -hmm. the fact that they were photos in and of itself meant that they were received as fact. So yes. no one would have looked at these images and thought, oh, this is the photographer's artistic representation of women. No, they would have looked at them and taken them as fact. Yeah, now that, that's it. And that's the, um, and like you said, these were, so France colonized Algeria. So it, it was occupied. And, and then what happened was that then you then had an, a revolution taking place where the people of Algeria were trying to remove them. So, and they, they didn't want to be occupied, obviously. But then they, how would you say then that these photos, because uh, in the article you mentioned that they distribute these photos as postcards in France, mm -hmm. which is, uh, when I was reading, I just found that um, unbelievable that, because um, these, these images are basically pornographic and they had no problem distributing this and saying, this is what the women of Algeria look like. This is who they are. And you can, it just makes you think quite, I was dumbfounded really when I, when I was reading the article that this is, because you know that, the, you know, it depends actually, to be honest, how much time you've had to read history. But um, when you hear things like this, like when you were doing your research, were you quite surprised by what you were reading and finding out? Well, so I, I, I'd known about a lot of this for a long time. And so it wasn't a huge shock, mm -hmm. but just seeing those images, I mean, I've been writing this article for months. It really took me a long time just to put it together because it's not the nicest subject to read about. They're mm. not nice images to look at. And so you kind of feel that, I suppose. And although I wasn't shocked, you still kind of feel the, the outrage and the anger and all those other emotions yeah. that kind of come with it. Um, just to put things into context, the images in my article are all taken from um, the work of Malik Alula, who was an Algerian writer and literary critic um, and so he, being an Algerian himself he collected these postcards and analyzed them from the perspective of an Algerian uh, really to show what the way he felt about them basically as an Algerian because he, he was never the intended um, spectator of these photos you have to remember they were never intended for an Algerian audience they mm -hmm. were intended for a European audience specifically um, and so these photos were taken between 1900 and 1930. The French actually occupied Algeria for 132 years. Mm. And that period was really marked by a lot of violence. It was a very, very brutal occupation. And the War of Independence finally brought that period to an end in 1962. But during that time, the French really kind of picked on the veil. They really chose the veil as something to target. Okay, so during this period, um, because it was really marked by violence, because the, the French occupied Algeria for 100, 162 years. And during that time, there was a resistance movement that tried to fight against the French. And it was very brutally, um, you know, that resistance was brutally fought against by the French. So the veil was really picked on by the French very early on. 
the repercussions for the Algerian people, ha, you know, have continued into the modern day. But very early on, the French, the French really kind of chose the veil as something to target. So according to Franz Fanon, who was, um, who was a writer and a thinker, the veil was seen as a symbol of the Algerian woman. And so the French very quickly and very deliberately chose to focus um, on associating unveiling with liberation from oppression as though women were being oppressed by the veil. And so when you know that, um, and then you look at these photos, you kind of see them in a whole different light because there really was this ideological agenda going on behind it. So it wasn't only about, um, you know, like satisfying the male European gaze by, you know, unveiling all these women. There was a real kind of a very political, a very ideological campaign also behind that directly related to colonialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting that um, the, 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 this whole unveiling, they had a, you're right, when I was reading about the French occupation of Algeria, they had a policy of unveiling, for, you know, sometimes forcibly unveiling Muslim women. And they, now what's interesting, they were very proud. They've never apologised for the French government or, you know, even after independence, they never apologised for, you know, for the way they behaved in Algeria, did they? Mm. No, the, the French are actually very well known for not acknowledging past crimes. So not only in relation to Algeria, in relation to other uh, other colonized countries as well. So yeah, no, as far as I know, they've never apologized. Because hmm. and one estimate of the number of Muslims in Algeria that died was seven hundred thousand, and that and that's like a um, a low estimate. That was you know given like in a middle ground between what France said and what you know often depends on what the Algerian government said, but you know seven hundred thousand Muslims were killed. And um, no apology, you know, I remember reading about that there's um, some skulls are kept in that have not been buried, the resistance fighters, you know, and Ahamna, I would really um, encourage everyone to do a bit of research about this, because, because I think that this is what I really like about, you know, your whole website and, and this article in particular, that it, you're showing us our history, a history that we will never be shown or taught in schools, whether in the UK or France, you know, governments don't want to talk about their colonial past in honest terms. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think it's really, really important for us to understand the situation we kind of find ourselves in today. We really need to understand what's happened before, before us. Hmm. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so although colonialism has ended, um, it still exists in other forms and to really kind of understand that you need to know your history yeah and from Muslim sources I think that's the thing that um, it's good to read you know you know they, the famous saying goes in history is written by the victors and that will be we will get one version of history from you know our schooling but when we school ourselves and it's and again alhamdulillah I'm so happy that your website exists you know sacred footstep that this is something we should be doing because then we don't feel like our uh, you know our identity started since you know when our parents came here as immigrants um from the muslim world now we have a much ri richer history but also what interference what was done to our identity in muslim countries and even you know when we look at our countries and we think oh it's such a you know it's a bit of a mess and there's problems it's things like this happened in our countries that changed our thinking. So for example, I remember you, you mentioned that some, some Algerian women have contacted you. What did they say about your article? Yeah, so I had a few women message me. Some were saying that they just were not aware of what had happened. And so it made them understand what's going on today having read the article which I thought was really interesting because one of the women told me that this isn't common knowledge even within Algeria which I found quite surprising I, I would have I, I assumed that people you know were kind of aware of what had happened but yeah um, like you said history is written by the victors and yeah it's really important to kind of understand these alternative I don't want to call them alternative mm, histories yeah you're it right it sound like they're not yeah, true yeah yeah that's right um but yeah, you, and there's, there are a lot of people doing this kind of work. Um, we're not the only ones, but um, yeah. And I think things are getting better. I think people are, are becoming more aware as well. Um, but I just want to mention that in terms of photography, because that was the focus of my article specifically, I think it's really important because we obviously live in a, an extremely intensely visual world. 
um, and social media has obviously exacerbated that and I don't think that's going to ever change now but we should really question sometimes you know when we look at images especially taken by you know famous photographers with huge followings and that are kind of celebrated by institutions like National Geographic we should really question how those images are framed and what they're saying about the people that are in them. Because often what you'll find is that the tropes that, you know, are repeated over and over again and have become the standard for what is considered quote unquote good photography, often their roots lie very much in colonial photography and very orientalist trope. And so we should always be questioning that because I think that when you see things so often, you just become used to them and you become desensitized and you don't necessarily realize there's a problem. However, these tropes are really perpetuating the, the same kind of Orientalist narrative and repeating the same stereotypes about quote unquote Eastern people for want of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a very good article on our website written by one of our writers, Zarar, um, and it's called Creating the Native. And he mm. talks about how, what tropes are used in photography and what they're actually saying about those people and how those things are still continuing. And photographers like Steve McCurry are instrumental in that. And it was that, um, and I, and the, yeah, and he wrote a really interesting, I don't know whether he's written it for your website as well about, again, he, the, the way he writes is very like, again, like you said, certain stereotypes of Muslims is conveyed through his book. Yeah. But, yeah, but you're right through the imagery in particular. So when so what we can clearly see and alhamdulillah your article really illustrates that is that the french definitely felt they were superior to the women and and the men of algeria the muslims of algeria and it's so and it's um and it's you know having the audacity and feeling so superior that we can do this to women and get away with it and who's going to stop us and but this also then connected that was imposing their liberal values onto the Muslim women, because they were going to civilize them. Um, mm. And it's interesting that even in, now in 2021, although you can't go and physically occupy Muslim countries, you know, um, as colonizers, you know, but it's, that's not possible. But what we can see is like, is for example, the French government is continuing that policy and that thinking that they want to unveil and ban the hijab, you know, so they've banned it in schools and in universities. And it, you, you know, when when I was reading that your article, it made me think of what's happening now. Do, do you do you see a, a comparison there? Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely, because the association of the veil as oppressive um, and unveiling as liberation that persists, you know, throughout Europe today, but sp especially in France. So yeah, and all of the roots of that kind of go back to this period. Um, so yeah, very much so. Mm. So uh, yeah, so alhamdulillah. Um, Jazakallah like khair for for coming on and um to telling us about this what are you what are you writing at the moment is there are you working on another article at the moment I, I am yeah so yeah. this this article was actually supposed to be a different one <laughs> this Algeria one but it had gotten so long I ended up dividing it into half mm -hmm. um, but I'm writing an article about how these certain aesthetics are kind of repeated constantly and so this harem imagery was also repeated in Turkey um, in, within the Ottoman Empire um, oh. but it's really interesting because the Sultan at the time he could he saw the harm in obviously portraying women in this way Muslim women mm -hmm. and he actually banned um, Ottoman photographers from uh, from from portraying Muslim women in this way but what ended up happening was those same um, photographers who were Muslim they used minorities within the within the empire and portrayed mm -hmm. them in this way instead and so although they didn't exploit Muslim women in this way, they ended up exploiting other women, oh. um, you know, non-Muslim women, which obviously is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that article is kind of looking at how power kind of plays a role because, you know, within that situation, you know, the Ottoman Muslims were in power, but they ended up oppressing a minority in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just kind of exploring how these aesthetics are repeated and how power also plays its role in that. Mm -hmm. I think I can't wait to read that one, inshallah. Um, so, Jazakallah khair, Sarah. Um, so, um, the website is sacredfootsteps.org. You know, I can't recommend it highly, you know, enough, inshallah. Um, so, definitely check it out. And I'd love to have you on again once you've once you've finished that article, inshallah. We, we must speak again. 
Inshallah, yeah. No, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Great. Inshallah, have a have a good. Uh, what are your plans for the rest of the day? It's such a, a lovely sunny day today. Uh, I'd probably go outside until <laughs> my kids come home, so they'll be home soon from oh, school. Alhamdulillah. Oh, that's excellent. Okay, then. T- this episode is brought to you by farhatamin.com, a website that specialises in Islamic stickers, Muslim activity books, as well as Ramadan and e-decorations. Wholesale and reseller inquiries are also welcome. So visit farhatamin.com today.